Big church. <laughs> I've heard better. I got friends, close friends, who won't allow me to pick a movie anymore because uh, I have a string of bad movie choices. Not that, not that they were uh, naughty movies. They're just bad the way they're put together. I like anything space. You been here long enough to know that I like space stuff because I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid, so space movies just kind of draw my attention, and then I, I talked the whole group into going and seeing the movie Gravity, one of the worst space movies ever put together. You know, had right actors, just terrible storyline, and, and then Moonfall, I thought that'd be a good one. It's, it's horrible, and, uh, and then you'd think anything with Brad Pitt in it would be, uh, no. Uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, this is his worst scoring movie. I picked every one of those, and they were all so mad at me. They are like, that's it. So I thought, okay, i got to redeem myself. And uh, a few years back, as, as I, I, I wanted them to see the movie Hobbit. They, they had never seen any of the trilogy of the, of the Lord of the Rings. And, and if you're looking for Ron's favorite movies, right there they are. The Lord of the Rings trilogy is my all-time favorite movies. And, uh, but they didn't know the backstory. They didn't, and The Hobbit is supposed to be an early story, but they were so lost through the whole thing. I came out of that Hobbit movie, man, I was cranked. I was like, wasn't that awesome? And they went, no. <laughs> they like hated it. And, uh, and wouldn't see any, and so I've been barred from picking any films now as far as their concern. Same thing happens in the Bible, by the way. If you don't know some of the basic narrative of what the Bible is trying to, if you just try to jump in somewhere in the middle, you're going to be so lost. All right? So we created a series titled Long Story Short. All I'm trying to do is trying to capture the three big major themes through the Scripture to do it all in just three sermons to cover Genesis all the way to Revelation in just three short 20-minute sermons. If you were here last week, we did Genesis all the way to the end of the Old Testament. We talked about how everything was created amazingly good, and then it slipped into chaos. At the beginning, you have the creation of the world. It's spectacular. God is speaking and things are happening all over. There's not a contradiction between science and faith, that, that, even though you've been told that. That's just told to you to minimize the Christian view. That's all they're trying to do. Uh, science tries to tell us how something came into being. Faith tells us who did it. And so the Bible says God is behind all of this. Creation, perfect. Adam and Eve were made. They're put into a paradise garden. Everything is awesome and amazing. And then all of a sudden, here comes our villain, Satan. And Satan tempts Adam and Eve. And with that temptation, there's one bite of an apple. And next thing you know, all of mankind is spiraling out of control. We then move into a chaos. All through the Old Testament, the Old Testament is filled with these little short stories. People, some good people, don't get me wrong, but if you stay with the story long enough, there's going to be a fall. It happens over and over and over again, and it takes us that way from the Old Testament, from Genesis all the way to the end of Malachi, and you leave the Old Testament wondering, can anybody save us? The chaos is so great in the world. Can anything change this course of where the world is headed? And then that's when you turn the page. And in Matthew, four little gospel stories about Jesus Christ, you're introduced to him. This is what God is trying to do in this Bible. It's, it's, it's why it was given to you. It's a narrative that begins with God, takes us to Jesus Christ. And now catch this. Next week is where you and I are weaved into the story. You are a part of his narrative that he's telling, the story that's been told for uh, thousands and thousands of years. It's a beautiful story. Adam and Eve, they may have been the first to sin, but you are not victims of Adam and Eve. You and I are participants. <laughs> you know, Adam and Eve sinned, now we all got to sin. No, that's not what happens. We're not victims, we're participants. Paul talked about this in Romans chapter 3. For all, all have sinned and have fallen short. All of us. I can't blame Adam and Eve on what's going on in my life. I just want things my way sometimes. And God says, well, I, 
if you would listen to me and do things my way, it would turn out a lot better. And No, I want things my way, and this is the world we live in right now. And I disobeyed. Sin, sin is a big religious word, I know, but all it basically means is that we disobeyed God. That's the bottom line of sin. You know, how can God consider all sins the same? Because it's all just disobedience. On earth, we see things as different. You know, murder is much worse than just lying. I, but not when God's looking at it, because it's all just plain disobedience. The Garden of Eden taught us that obedience le leads to joy and disobedience leads to sorrow, and that's exactly what happened. So we're looking for something. Now we're trapped. The Old Testament, you're trapped in darkness, but you're looking for a light. In the Old Testament, Testament you're, you're stuck in struggle and pain, but you're looking for relief. You're looking for rest. In the Old Testament, we're stuck in our sin, and, and it leaves looking for a Savior. And then we're introduced to Jesus. Romans chapter 5 says, For just as through the disobedience of one man many were made sinners, so also through, one, through obedience of one man many will be made righteous. Who's the one man who brought about disobedience? Adam. Who's the one man that brings about righteousness? Jesus. This is the good news. I, I shared with you last week, in order for there to be good news, it has to invade bad news. Before you and I could embrace the good news of Jesus Christ, we had, to, we had to accept and embrace the bad news of our life, that I'm a sinner, and so are you. Luke chapter 4, Jesus said himself, I've come to proclaim this good news. I've come for this. I had a string of bad news earlier this year. You, you, you know this, there's some new people with us. Last Christmas, I ended up with a heart uh, condition. I ended up experiencing a flutter in my heart. <laughs> I didn't know what in the world was going on. And after several weeks of struggling with this little heart flutter, I mean, I could just feel it. You know, I finally opened up and said something to my wife. And uh, uh, she said, you're drinking too much caffeine. She's not the physician you would think she is, by the way. I tried to take out all the caffeine in my life. I still had it. It went that way through January, through February. I went on a cruise, had several big episodes on a cruise, and, uh, and then came back and finally started a series of doctors. And Anyway, I finally met a physician who said, I, I can fix that. All right. And so July, I had the procedure. He recently... He, he said, you're good, you're normal. <laughs> well, that'll be news to my church. <laughs> but it was rough. In the procedure, uh, my heart went into full AFib right in the middle of it. He knew exactly where to hit all the ablations, six ablations to get it stopped. He kept zapping my heart and getting this electrical pathway cauterized. And anyway, when he came out, my wife can contest to this. He, he, said, he said, I cannot believe how bad it was. He said, you're, you're, that heart condition was terrible. He said, one of the worst I've ever seen. He said, I cannot believe this whole time you've been experiencing this and you haven't passed out one time. Those were his exact words. I heard him say, it would have killed a weaker man in this world. <laughs> A physician came along and said, I can fix this. Jesus is called the great physician. When you're in your Bible reading mode and you're reading through the Old Testament, and I know it's really heavy at times, it's hard to get through, but there's just overall narrative that creation moves to chaos. That's the theme of the Old Testament. Creation moves to chaos. Today, though, all this chaos if it would just turn to Christ, could be fixed. That the more Christ is added to the chaos of our world, the more it can be fixed. Jesus says, why did Jesus come? Well, let's ask him why he came. And I'm telling you, it's all about the brokenness of our world around us, the fractured world. John chapter 12, verse 46. 
I have come to be a light in the darkness. These are Jesus' words. John 18, 37, I have come to testify to the truth. A world full of lies. There's truth in Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, I've come to give my life as a ransom for many. John 10, 9, I've come to seek and save the lost. John, uh, oh, that was Luke. John 4, 14, I've come to bring living water to the thirsty. John 10, 10, I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. Way back in the Garden of Eden, that was your introduction to Satan. That was your introduction to the thief. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we watch from Genesis all the way to Malachi, the thief stealing and killing and destroying. But Jesus says, but I've come, and now that starts this four, four little books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel. The word gospel means good news. I've come that you might have life and not just not just life, but life to the full. Boy, where do I get that? Inside of all of us, there is this nature to want to disobey. I got a granddaughter who likes to argue a lot. Five years old, feisty, <laughs> just spitting vinegar half her time, and she just loves to argue. And I warned her. I said, listen, kiddo, stop arguing with your papa if you don't there's going to be consequences. She went, uh-uh. I said, uh-huh. She went, uh-uh. And I said, uh-huh. And uh -huh. You're proving my point right here. This, this nature to want to disobey that starts really early follows us into our adulthood. I can prove it right now that it's in you. You're like, I, I don't have a nature to disobey. Sure you do. Right now, for the next few, I don't want anyone to look behind you. What, whatever's going on in the back of the room, I don't want you to look behind you. Keep your eyes straight up here at me. Don't look back. Look at me. Now be honest with me. What are you just dying to do right now? <laughs> Doesn't that just kill you that you can't, because I'm watching you? There's nothing going on behind you, but it's just this nature inside of us that wants to disobey, and that nature has to be dealt with. Someone had to come along and get that nature back on track with God. And sure enough, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came. At just the right time, he died for us. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. At my worst, that's when he came. He said, you know what, I... Ron cannot fix himself, and you can't fix yourself. As much as you would like to think, that's called humanism. Don't buy into the humanism of our world. That we can fix this problem. We're all smart people. If you just follow the right politician, we can fix everything. No, you can't. It was beyond repair in us. We needed someone outside of us to come in and to do that fixing. Well, isn't Jesus just a crutch? Yeah, he is a crutch. If you, you know what? If you're having trouble walking, a crutch can be a really welcome thing in our life. Now nah, you just use Jesus like a crutch. Well, yeah, if your leg is hurting bad, it's, it's needed. So a few years back, I had a meniscus tear in my knee. It's something that uh, people who are highly athletic suffer with. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, meniscus tear. And again, it was a physician. I, I can fix that. And there's a lot of discomfort, I know, but I can fix it. He went in and he fixed it, and then I'm coming out of surgery. He said, now listen, don't put any weight on that knee. He said, I want you to use these crutches. He said, I know you feel great right now, but that's because there's this pain blocker in you. And you're just, he goes, if you fall behind the pain, you'll be in big trouble. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they wheeled me out to the car. Bonnie was waiting for me. I jumped out of the wheelchair, walked to the car. She's like, you're supposed to use your crutch. I don't need no crutch. <laughs> Got home, jumped out of the car, walked up the stairs. I can't believe how good I feel. Nine o'clock that night, I was in so much discomfort. I was like a baby at night. And it just, and sure enough, 
<laughs> where are those crutches? crutches? And for the next few days, I loved having those crutches. If you're broken and you recognize you're broken, if you realize that, man, life is so hard, I need something to lean on. Jesus is a crutch. And I've learned to lean on him. This is the good news of the gospel. When you realize that this whole world is chaotic and a mess and broken and fractured, and then you have Jesus who says, I can fix that. I'm a physician. I can fix that. No other religion in the world has that level of good news. The rest of religions are all fix yourself first and then maybe God will take you back. That's all other religions. You fix yourself first. If you perform enough, then maybe God will take you back. That's not Christianity. Christianity is God takes us back first. And then he starts putting the pieces of our lives back together. Nobody wants to admit that. They think there's weakness in that. But God says, in your weakness, I'm made strong. In Psalm chapter 40, it says this. He lifted me out of the slimy pit and out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand. Who did that? The Lord did it. I'm not going to look into myself anymore to fix me. It won't work. I need him to fix me. That's the message of the Gospels. You know the story of Humpty Dumpty. Most people do. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men could not put Humpty together again. Well, there's more to the story. Surprisingly, Humpty is in this broken mess. And uh, at that time, the people around him were cruel. <laughs> you know, what was he doing up on that wall? No egg should put himself in that situation. What did he think was going to happen? You know, if you go down this track, bad things happen to people and you, you, you chose all the wrong paths and you chose the wrong friends. And, you know, people can just be cruel in those moments of great falls. But word got to the king at the palace that Humpty had had a great fall and the king was good and the king was compassionate. And he said, you know what? I have powers that my horses and my men do not have. And I think I'll go down and try to help Humpty. And so the king exchanged all of his kingly uh, wear and his kingly garments and his kingly status. He put on clothes like that of a commoner, came down and and, and for a moment, acted as if he was a peasant. He walked through the streets looking for Humpty Dumpty, finally found him, came up to him, and Humpty said, hey, stay back, I'm a, I'm a mess. <laughs> the king leaned in, it is I, your king. Would you like this to be put back together? Oh boy, would I. But look at the shattered brokenness of my life. Yeah, I know. And the king in his compassion and tenderness started to put Humpty back together again. What's really quite amazing is that the rest of the community would look at Humpty Dumpty and all they could still see were those fractures and those cracks. But when the king looked at him, he was made perfect again. The king didn't see any of the fall. That's a fairy tale. But when you're in the Bible and you turn and you see the name Jesus, that's what he comes to do. The only hope our world has is to embrace the story of Jesus. The only hope you have is to embrace the story of Jesus Christ. And I know that when you're in this moment, you would love to show some gratitude to God. How do you say thankful? How do you say... I? Thank you for someone who comes and dies for you. Gratitude just seems so small. Putting offering in a church offering is a good thing, but it's, it's not the one thing he wants most from you today. He wants you. 
He wants your whole heart. He wants you to come over to his side and experience the freedom of all that guilt. Yeah, I, I may have made a mess a few times of my life. I'm a sinner. But I've been repaired and put back into service through a king who is kind and good. That's the story of the Gospels. Next week, we weave our story then into his. I'll show you how that happens through the church. But today, today it's about one name and one name only. The name of Jesus. Do you have him?